president announced uh, he was moving thousands of high-ranking gang members to the country's new so-called mega jail. Frijol, arroz, un huevo duro en la mañana. El menú del desayuno se repite en la cena. If you are considering committing a crime in El Salvador, you might want to consider a different career path. Yes, the infamous Alcatraz prison is notorious for its grim and tough conditions, but it's got nothing on El Salvador's center for the confinement of terrorism, or what the locals know as CICOT. The living conditions in this jail make Alcatraz look like a walk in the park. Within a year that this prison was opened, it now houses over 12,000 inmates who are thought to be gang members. While some say it's a black hole for human rights and others say it's the only thing keeping the gang crime in El Salvador at bay, these new video footage of CCOT have revealed a far worse reality for inmates. Life in CCOT. Are the human rights of these inmates being sacrificed under the guise of providing security to the people of El Salvador? This is a question everyone who has seen the video of El Salvador's most notorious prison has been asking. In this newly released footage that went viral, the director of CCOT, whose identity remains undisclosed, led the media through the facility, warning journalists not to look the inmates in the eyes. This directive was part of the strict control maintained during the visit, with the director allowing himself to be filmed but not named. The tour was a rare glimpse into a facility that has been shrouded in mystery since its inception. CCOT emerged from the height of this crisis, a mega jail birthed as the ultimate solution to incarcerate high-ranking members of these criminal organizations. The facility was built in record time a year ago, in a location that was once nothing more than a desolate stretch of land. Now it stands as a testament to President Bukele's commitment to his Iron Fist approach, a policy that has seen his popularity soar, even as it has drawn the ire of human rights advocates. Situ 45 miles southeast of the capital, San Salvador, in the town of Tecoluca, Cicot sprawls over an expanse that can only be described as vast. The prison's design is a stark departure from any notion of rehabilitation or reform. Instead, it is the embodiment of punishment and containment. The warden of Cicot, his identity concealed behind a ski mask, speaks with a tone of grim pride about the facility's austere amenities, or rather, the lack thereof. The living conditions within Cicot are as severe as its exterior is imposing. Unlike like the infamous Alcatraz, which once stood as America's premier maximum security prison, or the Supermax facility of ADX Florence, CCOT is not just a prison, it is a fortress of solitude, designed to break the spirits of those within its walls. The prison's design is a maze of reinforced concrete, with eight buildings each housing 32 cells. These are not the spacious cells of Alcatraz, which measured a modest 5 feet by 9 feet, nor do they offer the concrete privacy of ADX Florence. Instead, CCOT's cells are intensely crowded spaces each about 100 square meters, intended to hold more than 100 inmates. The amenities are scarce, with only two sinks and two toilets per cell, and 80 metal bunks for every 100 prisoners. The cells are stark, with prisoners sleeping on four-tiered bunk beds made of bare metal, devoid of mattresses or sheets. The artificial lights within the facility are relentless, never turned off, even as night blankets the outside world. The density of the inmate population within these cells has drawn sharp criticism from rights groups and observers, who argue that the conditions violate international standards for incarceration. Yet for Bukele and his administration, these criticisms are a small price to pay for the security and order they believe CCOT will bring to their nation. The heat within the cells is oppressive, with temperatures reaching 35 degrees Celsius during the day, and the only ventilation comes from a lattice ceiling that provides a meager breath of air. Frijol, arroz, un huevo duro en la mañana. El menú del desayuno se repite en la cena. The inmates are given food, rice, beans, hard-boiled eggs, or pasta, and must eat with their hands, as any utensil could potentially be fashioned into a deadly weapon. The director of CCOT, who led a carefully choreographed tour for international media, emphasizes this point as a necessary precaution in a place where violence once reigned supreme. Life inside CCOT is defined by isolation and surveillance. Prisoners are allowed out of their cells only for legal hearings, conducted via video conference to minimize any risk of escape or violence. The prisoners' daily routine is monotonous and confined. They are allowed out of their cells for only 30 minutes each day to exercise in the central corridor of Block 3, the only area the media were permitted to see. In comparison, the inmates of ADX Florence, despite their isolation, have access to radios and, for those who comply with the rules, televisions with limited channels. Alcatraz too, in its time, offered its inmates cold running water a cot and even the possibility of visitation, albeit under the strictest of conditions. Punishment for infractions is swift 
swift and severe, with offenders being sent to windowless, unlit isolation cells that strip away any remaining semblance of humanity. The guards are armed with guns, helmets, batons, and riot shields, patrolling the grounds with a vigilance that is both necessary and symbolic. CECOT's capacity is a testament to its scale and the government's commitment to its security policy. The facility is said to be able to hold up to 40,000 inmates, though the exact number of those currently incarcerated remains unclear. When pressed for details about the number of prisoners or the maximum capacity of each cell, the director's responses were evasive, suggesting that where 10 people could fit, 20 could be accommodated. Despite its state-of-the-art construction, CECOT has been shrouded in controversy. Critics have been quick to label it a black hole of human rights, where the guidelines set forth by international law are seemingly disregarded. Miguel Sare, a former member of the United Nations Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture, has decried the facility as a concrete and steel pit, an abyss where people are disposed of without the formal application of the death penalty. Yet, for many Salvadorans, the mega jail is a necessary evil, a cornerstone of Bukele's campaign that has seen a drastic reduction in the homicide rates that once branded El Salvador the murder capital of the world. The president's popularity soars with each gang member put behind bars, his success in the polls a testament to a populace weary of bloodshed and chaos. Gangs of El Salvador the construction of CECOT was a direct response to the bloodshed and terror sown by notorious gangs such as Mara Salvatrucha and the two factions of Barrio 18, the Revolucionarios and the Surenos. Why has such a tiny country like El Salvador, scarred by civil strife, become trapped once again in the clutches of such brutal conflict? In the 1980s, a brutal civil war ravaged El Salvador, displacing over a million people. This brutal conflict, pitting leftist guerrillas against a U.S.-backed Salvadoran government, government tore the fabric of society apart, leaving deep wounds that have yet to heal. The United States, determined to stem the tide of communism in Latin America, poured millions of dollars into the Salvadoran military. This support, however, came at a cost. The war claimed the lives of more than 75,000 Salvadorans, displaced countless others, and left a legacy of violence and mistrust. Many fled to the United States seeking refuge from the violence. It was in the urban sprawls of Los Angeles that Salvadoran immigrants, facing cultural alienation and economic hardship, banded together for protection, giving birth to what would become known as Mara Salvatrucha, or MS-13. Formed for protection against existing gangs, these groups quickly evolved into formidable criminal organizations. Their trademarks became their brutality and their bonds of loyalty, forged in the crucible of conflict and displacement. Another gang, Barrio 18, also took root, and the rivalry between these two groups became fierce. As the Civil War concluded in the 1990s, the United States began deporting convicted criminals back to El Salvador. Unintentionally, this policy exported the gang culture directly into the heart of El Salvador, a country already reeling from the aftermath of a brutal civil war. The deported members, hardened by life on the streets of LA, found fertile ground in the post-war chaos of El Salvador to expand their operations. They found fertile ground in the post-war chaos to expand their influence, recruiting from impoverished communities and establishing a reign of terror. They capitalized on the lack of opportunities for the youth, offering them a perverse form of social mobility ability within the gang hierarchy. The gang's influence spread like wildfire, and by the late 1990s, El Salvador was experiencing a surge in gang-related violence. MS-13 and Ley 18 carved out territories, imposing their brutal order. With civilians caught in the crossfire, the gangs evolved from street-level thuggery to complex criminal organizations, engaging in extortion, drug trafficking, and arms smuggling. They infiltrated communities, recruited the young and the desperate, and established a reign of terror that would dictate the rhythm of daily life in many Salvadoran cities. Their rise to power turned El Salvador into one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Their hallmark became brutal violence, a tool to maintain control and instill fear. They became parallel authorities, imposing taxes on local businesses and residents, and meeting out their savage justice to those who defied them. Tattoos and hand. Signs became their symbols of allegiance, and the Maras, as they are known, turned El Salvador into one of the most violent countries not at war. As the 21st century progressed, the gang's tactics became increasingly sophisticated. They diversified their criminal activities, engaging in transnational drug trafficking and human smuggling networks.
networks. The violence perpetrated by these gangs reached endemic levels, with El Salvador experiencing some of the highest homicide rates in the world. The war also fractured families and communities, creating a void that the gangs were all too eager to fill. The Civil War's former combatants, some of whom were highly trained and had access to weapons, were another pool of recruits for the gangs, bringing with them military tactics and discipline that would make the gangs even more formidable. The tough anti-immigration policies of the United States in the early 21st century led to another wave of deportations, further reinforcing the gang structures in El Salvador. Each new arrival brought with them knowledge, connections, and tactics learned on the streets of the United States, which were then adapted and applied with ruthless efficiency in the Salvadoran context. The government's initial response, mano dura, or iron fist policies, aimed to crush the gangs with military force. These hardline measures included militarized policing and the enactment of anti-gang legislation that allowed for the mass incarceration of suspected gang members. However, the crackdown did not yield the expected results. Prisons became overcrowded pressure cookers where gang culture thrived and leadership structures strengthened. Rather than dismantling the gangs, the Monodura policies inadvertently facilitated the creation of more organized and resilient criminal enterprises. The Iron Fist approach also led to a significant erosion of civil liberties and fostered an environment where human rights abuses by security forces went unchecked. The aggressive tactics did little to address the underlying social issues that fueled gang membership, such as poverty, lack of education, and limited economic opportunities. As a result, the cycle of violence continued, with gangs becoming more deeply entrenched in Salvadoran society. The early 2000s saw a continuation of these forceful policies, with successive governments launching campaigns that filled the prisons to the brim with gang members. However, these overcrowded prisons became incubators for gangs, places where they could regroup, organize, and strengthen their networks. It was within these walls that the gangs, which were once rivals, learned to coexist and even collaborate, leading to a more unified and formidable criminal enterprise upon their release. In a controversial twist, a truce between MS-13, Barrio 18, and the government was brokered in the early 2010s. This truce, while significantly reducing the homicide rate, was met with widespread skepticism. Many believed it was merely a band-aid solution, one that empowered and legitimized the gangs, allowing them to consolidate power and control over their territories. The truce eventually unraveled, leading to a resurgence of violence and the highest murder rate in the world by 2015. The gangs had become de facto rulers in many communities, their influence extending into the political realm. They leveraged their power to extract concessions from politicians, often swaying elections through intimidation or negotiation. The state's inability to provide security and basic services allowed the gangs to fill the vacuum, further entrenching their position in Salvadoran society. The Al Jazeera article from March 28, 2022, paints a grim picture of the current state of affairs. Over a single weekend, more than 80 people were murdered, with 62 killings occurring on one harrowing Saturday. This spike in violence has been attributed to MS-13, a clear message to the government that the gang remains a force to be reckoned with. Security experts suggest that these acts of violence could be part of a negotiation tactic, a brutal demonstration of power aimed at securing concessions from the government. President Buchel's War Against Gangs CCOT's origin story is as dramatic as its purpose is clear. El Salvador, a country once besieged by an alarming murder rate, found itself at a crossroads. Gangs with their networks and ruthless operations had sunk their claws deep into the fabric of society, challenging the very rule of law. It was against this backdrop that President Nayib Bukele, a leader with a vision steeped in ironclad resolve, took office with a promise to restore order and safety to his crime-ridden nation. In March 2022, Bukele declared what could only be described as a war on the gangs that had long held his country in a vice-like grip. The streets of El Salvador were no longer to be a battleground for warring factions. Instead, they would become the arteries of a society striving for peace and prosperity. But to achieve this, Bukele knew that he needed more than just rhetoric. He needed a fortress, a place where the most hardened criminals could be contained and kept away from the society they had terrorized. In the face of such chaos, President Bukele rose to power on the promise of restoring order and safety to a country in mourning. His solution is as radical as it is controversial. A mega prison, the Centro de Confinamiento del Terrorismo, or Quequiat, designed to incarcerate the multitude of gang members that his administration has apprehended in its sweeping crackdown. Following his solution, the nation of El Salvador saw a bloody killing spree that saw dozens of Salvadorans lose their lives to gang violence. Bukele made a decisive move. He announced a state of emergency, a declaration that would suspend important constitutional rights 
such as due process and freedom of association. This was the beginning of his mano dura, or iron fist policy, a hardline approach that would see the mass arrest of suspected gang members and associates. The streets of El Salvador were transformed as soldiers and police launched a relentless campaign of raids and arrests. The gangs were met with an iron fist, and there would be no mercy for those caught in its grasp. As the arrests mounted, reaching into the tens of thousands, the jails swelled beyond capacity. Reports of human rights violations began to surface, with allegations of torture and ill treatment in detention, and arbitrary arrests based on questionable evidence. The line between justice and abuse blurred, and the international community cast a wary eye on Bukele's methods. Despite the lack of transparency, a significant drop in homicides was reported, drawing parallels to the reduction seen during the years of the truce. This led to speculation that Bukele's government might be engaging in a similar, albeit covert, negotiation with the gangs. Thus, the concept of CECOT was born, not just as a prison, but as a symbol of the state's unyielding commitment to combating gang violence. President Bukele, in the face of international condemnation, remains steadfast in his defense of CECOT. He takes to social media with a combative tone, drawing parallels between the United States' controversial incarceration practices and his approach to dealing with what he deems proven criminals. His tweets, provocative and unapologetic, reflect a leader who believes that extreme problems require extreme solutions. He tweeted the following statement. How did we do it? Putting criminals in jail. Is there space? Now yes. Will they be able to give orders from inside? No. Can they escape? No. A work of common sense. Accompanying the tweet was a video, a visual testament to the scale of the government's undertaking. The footage showcased the sprawling expanse of the CECOT, a facility designed to be escape-proof and to sever the lines of communication that gang leaders had previously used to orchestrate criminal activities from behind bars. The director's tour, which took place in the middle of the night, was the government response to international scrutiny. The media's access to CECOT was granted two days after President Bukla celebrated his victory in the presidential election, securing more than 80% of the votes. The timing of the tour was strategic, an attempt to showcase the government's handling of the gang members who had previously held the country in a grip of fear and violence. The media coverage of this event was as swift as it was pervasive. Major U.S. publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Associated Press, were quick to pick up the story Story, chronicling the prison's opening and the government's aggressive campaign against gangs. The images of the prison's first transfers, described as dramatic and shocking, made their way across the globe, with the BBC publishing the stark visuals that would become synonymous with the Secot prison. Salvadoran news sources, too, were abuzz with the developments. El Mundo, a national publication, detailed the second prisoner transfer and the international concerns that were beginning to surface. Human rights organizations and observers were watching closely, their eyes trained on the unfolding situation and the potential implications for the inmates' treatment and well-being. The presence of officials such as Osiris Luna Meza, Mauricio Ariaza Chicas, Rene Marino Monroy, and Romeo Herrera underscored the collective effort, according to a poll conducted by CISCA in March 2023. An overwhelming majority of respondents supported the construction of the CECOT prison. This statistic, 96.4% in favor, highlights the public's backing of Bukele's hardline policies, even as a small minority, 3.6%, voiced opposition. The CECOT is more than a prison. It is the linchpin of a strategy that has brought about a dramatic reduction in violence. It is a message that resonates with a population weary of crime and yearning for peace. And while international observers may express concern or criticism, the government remains steadfast, touting the CECOT as a necessary tool in the war against gangs, a war that, according to official reports, is being won. Human rights violation in CECOT. The criticism extends beyond the walls of CECOT, touching on the broader implications of President Bukele's security policy. The government's crackdown on gangs has led to a surge in the country's incarceration rate, now the highest in the world. Human Rights Watch, an organization that stands as a sentinel for global human rights, has cast a spotlight on the Salvadoran government's tactics. In a damning report, it accuses the authorities of engaging in arbitrary arrests, where individuals are swept up in broad dragnets based on little more than suspicion or association. The report the report details how the state's actions have led to enforced disappearances, where the fate of those taken into custody remains shrouded in mystery, their families left in anguish. The report goes further, alleging torture and other forms of ill-treatment of detainees, painting a grim picture of a system where due process is a casualty of expediency. It claims that tens of thousands have been arrested without sufficient evidence, with some detentions based solely on physical appearances or social backgrounds, hinting at a disturbing trend of profiling that
that disproportionately affects the most vulnerable Salvadorans. More than 70,000 individuals have been detained under the State of Exception, an emergency measure that grants sweeping powers to the police and military. This has raised alarms among local and international human rights groups, which argue that many of those detained have no discernible links to gang activity. Furthermore, there are reports of forced collaboration with gangs, where individuals under the threat of violence have acted as lookouts or concealed weapons and drugs. These coerced actions have landed many in the overcrowded cells of Secot and other prisons, where conditions are said to be dire. The United States Department of State, in its assessment, corroborates these troubling findings. Its report from 2022 details how the state of exception in El Salvador, a legal provision that suspends certain constitutional rights in times of dire national emergencies, has placed an unbearable strain on the judicial system. The report describes a judiciary buckling under the weight of the government's unyielding campaign, where due process is not just undermined but often absent. The state of exception has also had dire implications for the prison conditions in El Salvador. The Department of State report highlights how the prison system, already teetering on the brink of collapse, has been inundated with more prisoners than it can humanely accommodate. This has led to a deterioration in conditions that are not only inhumane, but also counterproductive, as overcrowding and inadequate facilities only serve to exacerbate the very violence the government seeks to quell. Amnesty International has also weighed in, accusing the Salvadoran authorities of adopting a systematic policy of torture towards detainees suspected of gang affiliation. The report, published in December, highlights the grim reality of state custody, where deaths are not only the result of violence but also of inhumane imprisonment conditions and the denial of medical care. In the face of such criticism, the government maintains that CCOT is necessary to deal with hardened criminals responsible for heinous acts of violence. The prison director, whose identity is kept under wraps, insists that the facility complies with international standards. However, with no external institutions or NGOs allowed to visit, these claims remain unverified, leaving the world to wonder what truly goes on within the walls of El Salvador's mega jail. As we unravel the layers of this complex and unfolding story, the questions that arise are as deep as they are disquieting. How does a nation balance the scales of justice and security? What are the costs of peace and who pays the price? These are the questions that lie at the heart of the allegations against the El Salvador government, a narrative that continues to evolve with each passing day. If you want to see more videos like this, click on one of the cards on the screen.